people are helpful and informative and kind and just yeah thank thank you all of you all of you thank you um and keep keep it up cause... hey everybody this episode had some technical issues where i was trying to stream and luke's uh, connection dropped out a couple times so i've edited out some uh, clips to try and make it a, a little bit clearer and also put in some explanations of where uh, he was he was talking and the audio cut out so hopefully just try and bear with that uh, it wasn't ideal it does clean up the last half hour is pretty good so if the cutting in and out is is too annoying for you then maybe just skip ahead and listen to that final section um, but anyway just just so you know and uh, enjoy the episode Welcome to the Bitcoin Cash podcast, following Bitcoin Cash and its rise to global team, the flipping accelerates and BCH Dogecoin surge. Um, it's 26. Oh, shit. It is not. It, that is the wrong date. Let's just. Oh. I've already wrecked. Uh, what, not, what is the date today? It's the 26th of, of March, 2021. It's Thursday. Oh, World Earth Thursday. Day. All right. Well, we're busy destroying the planet <laughs> <laughs> with cryptocurrency mining. So. Uh, happy World Earth Day, everyone. Well, it's more like hopefully we can replace the banking system and it will be more efficient. 22nd. All right, let me just... This is the world's worst <laughs> intro, but it's my fault. You were doing a great job until I rudely interrupted. Um, the price, as always, uh, first off the mark, we got... Nine hundred and ten dollars USD this week. So actually, some pretty big gains on um, uh, the previous episode, which I think I think that was like in the four hundreds or five hundreds, maybe. Um, but anyway, huge surge. It's been in the last uh, you know week or so. It's been up to as high as about twelve hundred dollars, down to eight hundred, and now it's in the mid nine hundreds. It's uh, been fluctuating around and one BDC now only buys about 57 Bitcoin cash, which is a pretty big turnaround from a couple months back when we had, uh, well, maybe not even a couple months, maybe just a couple weeks where it was 118 to one, uh, as listeners of this podcast will, will remember. So how you've been, how you've been finding the price action there, Luke? Bitcoin cash holder whose profile is actually in the red because <laughs> um yeah which was possibly the worst moment but it's fine the thing although i did go all at once dollar cost, dollar cost averaging oh well, i think there's research which shows that the best uh you know strategy is to just put everything in at once like theoretically the optimum strategy is to just go all in and just wait right but obviously that's hard uh because yeah. if you just pick if you just get unlucky you got the wrong moment then it's much harder to sort of stomach that uh, in the long run. So yeah, viewers can be advised if they have diamond hands, then just all in and like commit for the long run. But if 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 you know that you're the kind of person that gets antsy, well, just buy two percent a week for fifty weeks. Uh, maybe throw in a bit extra when the price is kicking off and you FOMO in, uh, and then yeah, that will get you to a, a relatively a, a good price. But yeah, I, I guess uh, as as always, uh, you got you got to think in the the long run. And uh, Bitcoin Cash is at the bottom of a, a pretty brutal uh, bear market. So um, you know, in this hopefully it uh, well not hopefully I don't really hope I just think it'll it'll get better for me. I'm not worried about that. Right. So this week, uh, before we get onto the transactions, we're going to mix it up a bit by having a look at the hash rate in China which was uh took a huge hit uh on april the 15th there was supposedly some sort of a mining farm in china there was some big electricity outages in the uh you know parts of china and that just took out massive amounts of the bitcoin hash rate and actually <laughs> very little of the bch hash rate uh, because we had so little to begin with uh, i suppose and that, that is, will be reflected in the theme of this week uh, in terms of all the ripple effects of, of that going on. But it seems like it has somewhat uh, recovered after a bit of uh, up and down. But certainly uh, an interesting, um, 
you know, momentum shift in the crypto in the crypto worlds. Were you were you following this at all, or did you did you know about this even? Kind of checking on Reddit, there were lots of people saying that there was a coal plant that blew up in China. And then some other people were saying actually that's completely unfounded. There's no evidence of that at all. But what whatever happens, whatever it is, something yeah. something happened. Um, even if we're not completely yeah, sure I what have it no was. Idea, really, like uh, I, I again, I, I saw sort of something about that, but yeah, there was not really any confirmed stories. And in a lot of the ways, uh, the mining is a bit of a black box, especially when it comes to the the Chinese miners, who are obviously very prominent in the scene, but they don't do a lot of publicizing their own activity or, or, or something. You know, probably quite rightfully so, they they stay a bit off the radar. <laughs> for their own good, I think. Uh, but yeah, they, it's a huge uh, drop off in the hash rate. So then, th when it comes to the transactions, so uh, BCH is down uh, a little bit, uh, but BDC is down a lot. And with this very strange, it obviously just fluctuates up and down. But this very strange pattern here of of dropping off close to you know two hundred twenty thousand or so transactions. And then coming up a little and being down a little bit and there's a few um factors that can kind of play into that but my analysis of this uh is going to be and this is probably one of the biggest gaps between uh bdc and bch that we've seen so far but mostly by bdc dropping off rather than bch being on the rise but uh my yeah my analysis is that the, this is related to the hash rate because if the hash rate uh drops off then the uh, block time uh, slows down for BTC because this hash rate happened just after a difficulty reset, which is every two weeks. So because there was then less miners, it took them longer than 10 minutes. They were up to about 14 minutes to find a block. And obviously when you have less blocks and you have a tr transaction cap of uh, one megabyte, then you can only mine uh, so many transactions, right? So they were able to mine a lot less transactions in that time and on top of the fact that they were mining less transactions the fees which we're going to look at were going through the roof and as a result people are more likely to make bigger transactions which fill up more block space uh you know because there's more inputs and, and outputs um so as a result of all of that it has just decreased even though the bdc network is operating at capacity in terms of how many transactions it's still actually declining it hasn't even flatlined it's it's on the decline if there is a big uh problem you know with a decrease in their in their hash rate which is a big part of the whole death spiral flipping type theory so we're seeing sort of a bit of a test case here like this wasn't the main event so to speak but it kind of proves that that there is some some validity to that theory with regards to kind of the hash rate and you, you mentioned the larger transactions are obviously take up more more power more in the space. system so larger transactions um, by larger i don't mean in amount of like dollars or amount of bitcoin cent but i mean by, by the complexity of the transaction so the amount of uh, inputs and outputs to that transaction so in theory if i was going to send uh, like on noise.cash, right, you might get a hundred different transactions in for one cent each, but then to send them all out as a hundred, you know, one dollar, you have to aggregate together all those different previous uh, transactions that you've received. So that would be quite a big uh, transaction in terms of the amount of block space that it was taking up. So there's a, there's a bit of a correlation uh, yeah. because obviously a larger spend will more often be aggregating more things together, but it's not a perfect. Uh, correlation either yeah that's that kind of uh answers my next question I, I was wondering how it how it kind of defragments i was imagining kind of like defragmenting a, a hard drive yeah. or send point well, from an address because technically uh bitcoin there are you know you see your balance in your wallet is just a certain amount of uh you know a total of, of ten dollars say but what that actually is is that you have the keys to all the addresses that you've uh, received at and those keys have the outputs from the previous transactions because everything's linked in that transaction uh, history so yeah. yeah i mean this is this is just very interesting that bdc is at uh, max capacity and with a spike in fees whether it's correlated or it's uh, not it could just be just due to the slower block times but i have a bit of a theory that also the change in the cons in the spending patterns that come about as a result of that um, you know, impacts that too. Bitcoin core uh, mm. transaction price 
And it seems there was like a similar spike in 2018 ish. Yeah. Do you think well, it's from for similar reasons? Yeah, I don't know. I guess we're gonna we're gonna see. Sorry to cut you off, but yeah, we, we we're gonna see. I, I have a slide about that, uh, and we will get to that uh, in the rest of the show. But uh, so I guess yeah, maybe we'll just put a put a pin in that one and cu- and come back because I have a slide uh, in the you know with the, some of the context previously. So I, I will yeah, I will I will answer that question. All right. So one other thing, just before we get off the price, is that this week we've had Dogecoin making a huge uh, run. It sort of had made this previous run from down like sub uh, one cent up to over one cent, which was you know huge in the Dogecoin community, and then another run up to, uh, or I mean up to ten cents, uh, and then a huge run up to uh, nearly like over forty cent USD, and then it's crashed off, and then up, and then uh, back down. So a uh, huge excitement uh, in terms of crypto noobs getting involved and flooding into Dogecoin and some of them making a lot of money, some of them losing a lot of money uh, as, as typically goes on. But uh, undoubtedly that is, that is generating more interest in the, in the crypto space as it always uh, does. I mean, yeah, some people made a lot of money in this run up, but uh I guess there's there's always a greater fool. I, 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 don't, I don't know. Forty cents is huge. I, I've always yeah. thought of well, it was as until like recently. I, of- I, I guess so. Uh, yeah, that, that's right. If you were in, I had I had a lot of Doge going back in the day. I don't anymore. Rip. That was one of the problems with being an early crypto adopter. It got lost in one of the big exchange scams, uh, Cryptsy, when they just went offline. <laughs> that, that was the end of all my Dogecoin. So, <laughs> um, you know, the the problems, the trials and tribulations of, of uh, early crypto. But I'm sure there's still people getting uh, scammed like that today. No no question about it. And there'll be people buying Dogecoin and then forgetting about it and deleting it. And I, I don't know. Maybe it has further upside, right? I, I don't know whether to, you know, uh, think it, it's, it's going up or down. Like it seems like it usually it sells off after a bunch of people flood in because the existing holders who you know manipulated the price or hyped it up or whatever like these wall street bets people that are getting involved they're probably the suckers in this situation uh you know but <laughs> who knows right could be could be anything because uh, you know i mean the problem that it has right is that it has so much issuance at the moment I think it's like 5% inflation rate at the moment. Well, it will go down over time, but Dogecoin is just endlessly printed out, right? Unlike uh, Bitcoin Cash. So um, <laughs> that, that is one uh, problem that it does have. And that means that the higher the price goes, the more selling pressure there is from, from the miners uh, in terms of the, the USD, right? So it gets harder and harder for the price to go exponentially uh, higher. But uh, yeah, I don't know. We could can see maybe it'll get to a dollar maybe it won't but if you were going to get to a dollar you would have wanted to be in in down here if you're buying at 40 cents hoping to get to a dollar yeah i mean that's kind of meh for crypto i'd say yeah yeah so you're obviously a returning uh guest on the podcast so your first episode was the third ever episode uh on the 30th of january uh, 2021 so i was just interested to hear like it's now been two and a half months uh, you've been into into crypto. Uh, what 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 do you think? How's it how's it been? What's your impression uh, been? Luke talked about how being new to crypto, the price action and the psychology of that was just too much to handle. He had it on his phone and he was watching the price every single day, and it just became too overwhelming. So instead, he's changed to just checking in on the price once every couple of days. And that's a lot more manageable since he's seeing it as a long-term investment. So he's not planning to move in and out and is looking at other crypto apps like blockchain.poker to play some poker in BCA. Well, it's the, yeah, it's the, it's the constant battle of, uh, of crypto, right? Is that everybody is most interested in the price, but the thing that drives the price in the long term is real development, whether that's, you know, technical infrastructure or yeah, like adoption or new apps or yet yeah, new stuff in the in the community and it's just it's just a constant like uh, whirlwind of 
the price versus everything else and everybody gets excited because there's so many things going on like there's thousands of cryptos they're all doing their own strategies or their own takes of uh you know how to how to spread uh how to spread crypto and a lot of people are speculating and getting rich or getting poor <laughs> so yeah so as soon as I, yeah that's why I like obviously in these episodes i do always start with the price but uh, hopefully the majority of the content is not is not kind of price based because that yeah that gets old pretty quickly right like your dopamine receptors just wear out at a certain point from it's up it's down it's up it's down someone's rich someone's not oh no as soon as i bought more than a <laughs> tiny amount i was like Can't, better for your i just sanity. i just been yeah. up well it's just you you the human mind is not designed for t- that sort of 24 7 input of 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 uh, yeah hype and uh excitement like you just yeah you just you just can't take it really Okay, interesting, interesting. So the price, uh, price definitely getting mentioned, but kind of wishing the scene would would deliver a bit more and a bit of uh, blockchain poker. So de- definitely not uh, in that gambling uh, dopamine seeking uh, scenario. Then what's the uh, what's the million Bitcoin <laughs> here and there? <laughs> very true, very true. I hope I hope you've been there. I hope you've been doing well there. Um, okay, so yeah, let's let's look at maybe some underlying tech there just quickly. Uh, this week, uh, BCHN, who are the uh, most popular, I think, of there's about six um, main Bitcoin Cash uh, node uh, dev teams. They're the largest at the moment, um, but very helpfully, they're not trying to stay the largest. They're trying to help the ecosystem uh, spread around a bit more. And they released uh, t- version 23 of their software. So I want to give a, a shout out to them. They're doing um, great work. One of the changes in this was there's this chain transaction limit, which previously said that you could only have, uh, like if you spent a coin, but then before it was confirmed, you re-spent that coin on and on and on. Like let's say on blockchain.poker, like you might do a transaction every hand as to who won. Well, you couldn't have more than 50 hands w- within one block, right? Because otherwise you would have needed to start, uh, where you, there was just a limit you needed to have another um another block or you would have need to start a new uh transaction chain and that was a massive pain for uh developers of apps like blockchain.poker or noise.cash or these other services in the in the bch economy so as a result all of the nodes have been coordinating to take that take that limit out um and it's really good to see they, they've made that progress i'm sure that's uh, really helpful for the or the app developers. So there's two, there's two separate things. So you could think of, so a node is a copy of the Bitcoin cash, in this case, uh, blockchain that somebody has stored on their whole computer. And they generally break down into two kinds, two categories of nodes. So one is the mining nodes, which is obviously if the miners are trying to mine the new transactions, then they need to know what was the history and what, you know, so they can mine a block and then publish it out to the network. And then there's non-mining nodes, which is, uh, I mean, I don't run one, but I would like to run one uh, if I didn't c- kind of be planning to be moving around where you just host it on the network. You're not mining, but you are just facilitating more broadcasting of transactions around to the rest of the, the network to help the miners and just to help the decentralization of the network. And so, uh, so because you have like right now, there's about 1,200 Bitcoin Cash nodes, I think. And there's about 10,000 okay. uh, BTC nodes, right? And so the the whole idea is that the reason, you know, a government can't shut it down is because they would have to turn off every single one of those nodes, which are all sort of spread around the world. Half of them, or there's, there's, a, there's a fraction. Well, there's, there's two, no, no, so there's two different things there. So one is if they have more than 50% of the mining hash rate, so if they get a big chunk of the mining power, more than 51%, then they can uh, start messing around with the blockchain in terms of trying to rewrite some of the history or screw up people's transactions. Okay. But if they wanted to actually turn the whole network off, they would have to stop every single mining and non-mining node. Well, probably more than, you know, if there was two left, that would still be enough, basically. That would be pretty dire, but uh, that would, you know, that would still work. 
imagining like some kind of thriller where the government's trying to squash. Well, yeah, I mean, that would make a, a sick movie plot. I mean, I hope we don't get to that scenario, but that, that was, I mean, you know, in the early days of Bitcoin, people were running a node and it was not really uh, like a, a target or anything because it was so, it was security by obscurity, right? But now, the, I guess the government has looked at it and decided, look, this is not an effective way to attack uh, crypto, so they haven't really tried. But for instance, when we did see the split between BTC and BCH, there was people on the BCH node who, who were, did have their nodes attacked. You know, people had, uh, in at least one instance, uh, I heard of uh, people had like the feds show up at their house, like SWAT team show up at their house. Other people got DDoS, like... So it did on the on the Bitcoin Cash side. Well, at the time it was Bitcoin XT, but it it was it was pretty uh, intense, right? And that's why where part of the friction of this whole BTC versus BCH, um, you know, palaver comes from is because on the BTC side they're very adamant that they want to have as many non-mining nodes as possible, and that's why they want to uh, obviously restrict the block size limit so then they can all afford to have the hard drives or whatever to store that um, data. But on the BCH side, it's more a case of, well, if you grow the overall pie, then even with a smaller percentage of users running nodes, you still end up with more nodes is kind of the philosophy. To I've talked about before where the, the nodes are important. It's not that you don't want to have nodes, but they are, the in my mind, the least important aspect of the ecosystem, where the most important is the users, the second most important is the miners, then like, uh, you know, node developers, then businesses, uh, and then, you know, uh, nodes are, are at the bottom. So you do want to have uh, a lot of nodes. That's definitely a good thing because they do run the network. But uh, having 20x as many nodes is, is good in one sense, but it doesn't in practice make all that much difference to how resistant your network is is to attack where one of the huge problems on the BDC side is that they just have one node software. So even if they have 10,000 nodes, if one dev team have written the software that runs on 99.8%, I think it is of those nodes, then you can capture the dev team rather than the, rather than the 10,000 nodes and start putting in changes that, you know, uh, well, there's one, yeah, there's one software. It's called Bitcoin Core. That's why it's called Bitcoin Core or why I call it Bitcoin Core because there's just uh, one. <laughs> You're looking like shocked. You're like, this is crazy. Yeah, it's like having, you know, uh, you know, Android and iOS, but if you only had uh, iOS, then you were just locked in, right? And that was a big part of the split, right? So with Bitcoin Cash, there's Bitcoin Cash Node, there's Bitcoin Unlimited, there's Flowey, there's Bitcoin Verde, there's Knuth, and there's... Uh, I'm forgetting one. I feel really bad because, but there's six main, uh, uh, you know, dev teams now, right? Because part of the split was that the Bitcoin Cash side was like, we can't have this happening again, where one uh, central point of failure in terms of the the node development happens, right? So, okay, yeah. So then the next thing is to just say, yeah, Knuth, they've also just released a new um, node version as well, so. Shout out to them. So basically, yeah, it is it is very under the surface, right? This is not one of the top things that people look at when they see coin market cap. They see what crypto is going up, up or down, but under the surface, hugely, hugely important uh, as to as to how uh, strong your dev teams are and how uh, spread about they are in terms of the resilience of your of your network. Uh, yeah. Okay. So we had Coinbase IPO'd. Uh, recently with their coin uh, stock <laughs> on the NASDAQ. So the reference price they had was $250 uh, on the day of uh, release. It shot up. It's not showing this graph, but it was as high as about $420. Uh, and it's then sort of tailed off into the 300s and now just under $300. Uh, so yeah, I don't know, uh, were you considering buying any Coinbase stock or did you follow this closely? They have um, just been sued a whole bunch by by the government. They they've been fined really in billions of dollars. I think that. I'll have to look into that. Wow! Um, but something like ninety percent of the transactions. Oh are yeah, yeah, I did see this. Bitcoin yeah. was just yeah, and because uh, Charlie Lee, who is the founder of of Litecoin, 
again, I don't have all the story uh, straight, so take this as a real. Um, yeah, this is this is hardcore rumor city right here. But Charlie Lee, who was the founder of Litecoin, he worked at Coinbase, uh, and I think it's sort of tied into that that perhaps speculation only he was involved in uh you know p hyping up uh, litecoin by uh you know adding uh, trading volume to it and, and whatever and then uh, undoubtedly selling out at a good time for, him, for himself uh, so yeah i i'm, I'm sure there is uh, some some aspect of that and and all of this stuff it, it's very interesting because coinbase are such a large part of the crypto ecosystem uh, like they're definitely one of the biggest uh, and most well-known exchanges and, and so on and uh, of course yeah people have been uh, flooding into or, or in this like stock release you know their valuation just constantly goes through the roof because they are like a crypto bank effectively which is yeah which is a, on one hand it's a good thing because it helps onboard people and get accustomed to the idea of uh, crypto and so on but on the other hand, it also creates just a central point of failure, just like any other exchange where if people are not holding their own coins and they're just relying on Coinbase, Coinbase gets hacked or has some other problem, whether some, you know, internal compromise or could be anything. Now, I guess they're publicly traded. So if their stock, you know, if I guess it wouldn't happen exactly like this, but if somehow they ended up in like a GME type situation or, <laughs> or something was going on there, you know, investor funds could be at risk and so on and so forth. So. Yeah, all the listeners, if you've got Coinbase, use it, buy your crypto and whatever, but also learn to secure your own coins and take them out of out of there because which you'll find difficult with BTC, right? Which is why it's a big issue because uh, it'll cost you an arm and a leg in fees because you can't really use it. I'm finding the exchange I've been using. I've been using eToro, yeah. um, and they, they make you they put a hold hold on it for like ninety Crazy. days. So yeah, I've my my fraction of a coin that i got a couple of months ago i still don't actually have yeah. i can't commodity and I, I don't want it to be a commodity yeah yeah i want it to be a current i want it to be something i can use and spend yeah, you gotta switch it up with uh you know trying a different exchange or, or something then yeah interesting yeah oh, well uh yeah I, I i guess i didn't have any good <laughs> recommendation for you on that front so yeah that's partly partly my fault but Anyway, uh, so uh, giving them my my life story. All oh, right, yeah, yeah. So that is another real problem in crypto. But hopefully, uh, as it spreads around more, it becomes more and more sort of accessible. You know, just peer to peer, right? That's the whole. Uh, that's the whole point. That's the ultimate, the ultimate goal. So yeah, like when Coinbase did this IPO, they released this kind of hype video, which I couldn't find later. So I don't know whether they took it down or what happened to it. But it was with Brian Armstrong, who's the founder of uh, Coinbase and now a multi-billionaire. And he uh, was had this like the journey of Coinbase and everything like that. Uh, and it was this uh, focus on the Bitcoin white paper was very prominent in what he was kind of talking about, which is good because Coinbase, uh, they've always had Bitcoin cash on their homepage. And uh, it's their, you know, even even though for political reasons he obviously uh you know prudence was the better part of valor when it came to the block size debate i think in his heart he's he's still on the you know peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash uh vision so they always have it on the home page and uh, i'm sure behind the scenes he's quietly moving things in that direction uh anyway right so venmo also getting involved in in crypto so they've got bdc ethereum bch and ltc uh but again same as we just saw with paypal where they you you can buy these cryptos but you can't you can't do anything with them you can't trade them to other users you can't send them to external wallets therefore you can't use any apps in the in the ecosystem like you can't use blockchain.poker or anything like that you can literally just buy it and speculate on the price and that's it and then sell back out to usd well that's right there is not much uh point but i guess this is with all these sort of payment solutions are grappling with the fact that essentially their entire business is irrelevant if cryptocurrency gets adopted but 
uh, as it gets adopted, they sort of want to be in, a, uh, in on the <laughs> slice of the pie. So they're just sort of frantically trying to figure out where they can be the middleman in a system that does not have middlemen. Uh, so, I mean, it's good because it gives exposure to, to cryptos uh, in that sense, like it makes them seem more legitimate and obviously more users will be interested and, and so on. But probably it is also bad in the sense that people buy in some Bitcoin and don't realize that if they ever wanted to do anything with it, it would cost them $50, but they're still pumping the price by by buying it, uh, it in. But I guess they discover that as more uh, other people have crypto as well too. And then somebody says, yeah, send me some. And they go, oh shit, I can't. Uh, maybe that uh, switches the light bulb on for them to, to read more. I don't know. It's better, that, better than not that Venmo has a whole page advertising crypto uh, for sure. But as time goes on, I think they're going to have to figure out some other angle to be part of the part of the crypto uh, ecosystem because as more and more people are trading peer to peer, they're just not going to need uh, Venmo. But the the key point as well, I think, is that in the next probably six to twelve months, we're going to see so so many companies. Like if you're at any major company at this stage and you're not on this like bandwagon, like you're being left behind. If the conversation because companies are slow, right? They take six to 12 months for somebody to propose and then for go through a few meetings and then what are we going to do and blah, 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 blah. Like any, anybody who's worked at any kind of uh, even medium or small company knows that, right? So this is, this, it's got to be on the radar of every single place and pretty soon it'll be, you'll be in the you know minority if you don't have a crypto inter integration rather than, than if you do. Uh, yeah. Luke explains that the large British bank, NatWest, are not going to be accepting crypto. They've just completely banned it from any usage uh, with any of their services, which is an interesting direction for a bank to take. I mean, I found it fascinating that even in my own casual observation is that the funny thing was that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are at a huge intersection between technology finance, you know, um, politics, right, uh, anthropology, like a lot of different things uh, get get involved in the mix. But I guess the primary two are the software and the financial side. And Bitcoin was l embraced on the technology side much, much faster than on the finance side. And on the finance side, it's still uh, struggling. Like I still, I have tons of friends who are in finance or they, they work at banks or They've been, you know, very interested in the stock market and everything like that. And you try and uh, talk to them even a little bit about crypto and they're just like, they don't get it. Or after years and years and years of it just kicking off at this insane rate and they still don't want to hear it. And I, I'm fascinated that uh, people think that money is such a mystery, but that people who are in banking or finance or economics, that they know all these details of it. But then those very people are the ones who are least interested in the, in the innovation in the space. Well, I guess uh, the strategy has been in a large part, stick your head in the sand, uh, but that doesn't work because crypto is, you know, the bubble has popped, right? Like I think the hope was, well, this is a bubble and it'll pop and it'll go away. But every time the bubble pops and every time it comes back and it gets stronger and more diversified, more resilient, there's more education resources about it, more people in the world using it, more comments, it's just more, 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 everything uh, all the time. So. Uh, you can't ignore, uh, you know, you can't ignore a virus <laughs> forever <laughs> before it gets too out of hand. Yeah, I was thinking yeah, more like, a, right. like yeah, the definitely. Well, crypto is is anti fragile; it comes back stronger every time. So the banks are really starting to to get a bit worried, I think, and all these processes. So yeah, on the same topic, obviously, we had this week with. Uh, Rishi Sunak uh, again uh, for the international listeners who's the UK Chancellor of the Exchequer so I don't know what what would how you, it's like the head of finance basically like the head treasurer basically so pretty key person to have in any uh, administration and he has uh, tweeted this week Britcoin so that's at least not terrible branding so I got to give him uh, props for that but they've announced this new Bank of England task force to explore a UK central bank digital currency. So oh, we're going to see more and more of this is that different uh, governments, uh, much like the banks, are starting to get the idea that this is not going away uh, and 
that they've they've got to be at least somehow involved or some you know responsive in some respect because doing nothing is not really an option because crypto is just going to keep powering on uh, without them um so yeah i mean in my mind i think again much similar to the paypal yeah. and all that sort of stuff this legitimizes cryptos you know obviously it gets it more in the mind of people who are more you know trusting of uh those institutions and, and so on and so forth but i think ultimately any sort of uh, government cryptocurrency is doomed basically because I mean, it can exist, but it's never, ever going to be able to uh, appreciate against Bitcoin Cash or any other cryptos in the long run, because why, why would it? Everyone, your, your options are, even people who love the government, if they have the option of holding a government currency, which is like a fiat currency that we already have today, where the government controls the supply and makes more versus a free market currency, which is run by the free market and is going to develop and improve at so much of a faster rate. The government can barely, yeah, they're putting together a task force. Meanwhile, there's 9,000 cryptos being developed by the free market, like after, you know, a decade late, like they're not ever going to be anywhere close to the, the cutting edge. They're just going to get constantly blown out of the water. So Luke jokes about a sci-fi thriller movie where the government is trying to capture people running nodes in their homes yeah that's right yeah exactly these, these are them oh we got it we got some crack operatives <laughs> you know we got no you don't all the crack operatives are on the free market. they're already probably mostly rich from adopting crypto early and coding up the next big thing you know luke points out that the governments already have bank accounts that are basically digital well it's just called fiat currency yeah cool that's right yeah. None of my wages I actually get in bank or somewhere. It feels exactly the same as any arbitrary currency unit of it is worth compared. Yeah, that's right. To exactly. one unit. Uh, we already live in, you know, uh, the other... people are very fixated on this idea sometimes when you talk to them about cryptocurrency that they understand I have a $10 note even though 99.9% .9 of, of all the currency they personally own is just a number on a screen. And then let alone all the currency in the world, it's the exact same thing, right? Yeah. There's not, people have this sort of fantasy uh, because it's never corrected. There's not some, in the bank, there's not huge piles of hay bales of, of notes. There are some, but not nearly enough to cover all the deposits of everyone, right? So it is literally just numbers on a screen and so but somehow because there's that one percent of physical representation that's what people kind of latch on to versus uh, with cryptocurrency where there is zero percent of that physical rep except for cassatius coins uh, but yeah. luke is a school teacher so he explains that he told his 10 year old students about uh how there isn't just huge piles of money sitting in banks underground which was what they were already discussing among themselves and that that made them horrified as they wondered where all the money in the world was yeah well i'm sure they'll be uh, thinking about it or maybe ask their parents or or whatever their parents probably don't know either right that's the funny thing about it right is they'll ask their parents and their parents would give them some answer which does not really get to the heart of the matter and then uh at some point <laughs> somebody will send them some crypto and then then that's when they'll start to piece it all together because you got yeah you got to read up on this stuff and it's generally generally not taught in schools so yeah anyway all this to say that yeah my uh i would be you know i would not be buying britcoin uh even though if it gets released uh i i look forward to it getting absolutely destroyed on the free market i'll get one British pound sterling worth. <laughs> yeah, one Dogecoin or one Britcoin, which is the bigger the joke? Big Good joke. question. Probably the Britcoin, actually. Uh, so now we had uh, a sort of interesting shift this week with Tesla, who uh, were obviously in the last couple of months were accepting Bitcoin and it was a big, um, you know, event, uh, really kind of thing. Uh, and Elon Musk, you know, very uh, outspoken about oh, crypto is going to be the future and everything like that. But then s somebody this this week uh, called him out because on the Tesla page for a few hours, they stopped accepting Bitcoin. They took off the uh, the pay with Bitcoin button. It was in this screenshot. You can follow the Twitter link to have a look at it. And everybody thought, what's going on here? And this is obviously uh, intertwined with the 
problems with the uh, the feeds that we're going to get to, right? Uh, but I'm sure it's been a support nightmare that they announced it and they got a lot of PR and everything, but then because the network's so unreliable, it costs so much at the moment and they were not in the business of handing out refunds to every uh, guy who can't send his Bitcoin payment correctly. So yeah, it seems like maybe they were having second thoughts and they took it off, but then they got called out and they put it back on. So for one user... I think we were talking how um, websites test mm. certain yeah. features with smaller under their user base, and then probably not would have seen the same yeah. version. Like, and that's probably people immediately noticed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a hard, uh, hard thing to walk it back, you know. After oh, it was so hype and everything, we're adding Bitcoin, and then yeah, walking it back pretty pretty rough i mean i did see a few people commented and and confirmed that it was not just literally this one guy had doctored a screenshot like a, a few people said yeah yeah that was it but obviously pretty quickly they uh put it back on and it's funny because it's uh, reminiscent of when they announced it uh and everybody can go and look at the previous episodes that we talked about uh the tesla but they did change their description in the support uh Docs several times about what is Bitcoin, how to use it. They had a mention of Bitcoin Cash in there, then they took that out, then they put it back in. Uh, there was a back and forth, uh, obviously internally at Tesla as to as to what to, what to do about all this. And so yeah, now they've taken it off. So personally, for me, I took it as a huge uh, positive, really, that uh, my prediction that uh, Elon was going to swap over to Bitcoin Cash or Doge. Uh, is a lot more likely, I think, because I think obviously having practically implemented it where he had, I'm sure he would have looked into it, but maybe not to that depth required. But this time, you know, if they're discovering, oh, there's problems, the network, they, they're the only person to adopt Bitcoin as a merchant in the last four years. And there's a reason for that. And they're basically learning that firsthand. So I think at some point uh, we might we might see, see a shift towards... Uh, Bitcoin Cash or or maybe Dogecoin because he does love Dogecoin, but uh, accepting either or both of those would massively shake things up uh, after, especially after a public failure of like trying Bitcoin and it not really working. You know, well that's the struggle that the crypto market is in, and where where it will be. Yeah, sure. That's the theme of this episode is uh, with Bitcoin. If there is a flipping, let's say if Bitcoin stops being the number one currency because Bitcoin Cash overtakes it, or any crypto, maybe Ethereum overtakes it, or some other one, you know, gets to be number one, that that's gonna that's gonna shake things up a lot, right? Because to people outside of crypto, then it's like, oh, the, you know, it could be any new one any day of the week, right? How would they know? So that would probably shake their confidence in, in cryptocurrency as a whole. I'm not super worried about that because. In general, I find that it doesn't matter too much what people who don't own crypto think about it because they don't they don't own it. So it doesn't matter if they were they were probably skeptical ten years ago when they thought it was only used to buy drugs, and now maybe they've completely rewritten that narrative in their brain to some other excuse or reasoning. And if the next thing becomes, well, Bitcoin died, so they're all gone. I mean that that doesn't actually do anything to to stop them being gone. So I don't know. I get. Yeah, and it's just going to be that people are people have to. That's the new world with with crypto. Is people need to be more on the ball about their money. You can't just passively accept whatever is there, and uh, that must be fine. Well, you can, but it, it's historically gone quite poorly for the value of your savings. But in this new world where crypto is taking over, you've got to pick at least one because uh, at some at some point you're going to have to, or it's going to be whatever everyone else adopts, and that's what gets into the the network effect and everything. So yeah, we'll see how this uh, plays out. Very interesting, but I'm still strong on my prediction that uh, Bitcoin Cash or maybe Doge, but probably Bitcoin Cash will be the next next one to get in at Tesla, maybe, maybe in a little while. Okay, we had an interesting case of Bitcoin Cash getting uh, censored a little bit on, on Wikipedia. There's still a Bitcoin Cash page. I don't think that was under threat, but there was a category that had sort of collected related articles, I guess, about mining and nodes and, and different things. Uh, and that got deleted. Uh, Wikipedia, obviously, sort of anyone can edit, but it's more about uh, the 
uh, you know, the politics internally, right, of who's a moderator and who allows what. And one of the guys who is big on BDC, Greg Maxwell, who is one of the developers there, he's known for, he has been, uh, you know, a key moderator at Wikipedia and has been kicked out of there and had all his own dramas with them for, for completely unrelated to Bitcoin, his own, you know, opinions on different topics. Uh, but this kind of thing happening, it, it, it's just yet again, the propaganda campaign against uh, Bitcoin Cash continues. It's, it's a threat. That's what it is. You know, it's a, uh, because like I told you, it's the flippening, you know, ultimately there can only be one, not in the true sense, like, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV. There are actually several and they do coexist. But uh, if it's a winner takes all of something becomes, you know, an 80% of the global money supply and the rest are in sort of the 20%, uh, then it's going to be one top dog and uh, Bitcoin core crowd, as much as they sort of try and marginalize Bitcoin cash, they fanatically uh, worried about it because they're always going out of their way to try and create uh, grief in that community, which in the, in the short term is quite unfortunate, but in the long run, actually, it just makes the Bitcoin Cash community more resilient uh, because people have to be more educated to get involved. And then, you know, they spread yeah. that education to other users, actually. So uh, they... Luke wonders why the Bitcoin supporters are so busy editing Wikipedia yeah. rather than focusing on their own currency and trading it among themselves. If it's mm. the future, why aren't they doing that instead of focusing yeah. on other currencies? Wikipedia pages yeah well that's right and that that's why like you know you and i have done like a little bit of uh bitcoin cash trading w and so and i see that just overrules any amount of online back and forth or people buying on venmo to speculate and what like that that's transient that'll fade away right but in the long run uh it's yeah it's real real trading uh that just happens very very slowly but it's also very sticky because once people see it happen for real people know that crap online you know people say whatever they want online it doesn't uh doesn't stick necessarily so yeah so basically yeah like we've been talking about this is kind of the theme of this episode which is that in my personal opinion and i'll get your take in a second that the bitcoin btc it's starting to show pretty serious cracks you know it's always been known as the gold standard of crypto and the biggest uh and best uh, name in town and its reputation has carried it a long way uh, even after the fork and even as the user experience has got worse and all the innovation has died and all the key pick players in the scene, a lot of them have moved on to Ethereum or to Bitcoin Cash or other cryptocurrencies. And now we're sort of coming to the end of that uh, age a little bit, I feel, where the fees are rising, the price is kind of uh, stagnant, even though obviously it was recently at all-time highs, but it hasn't gone through a big euphoria and just spreading around to the rest of the world in the way you might have expected. The dominance uh, in relative to other currencies is dropping. Their own computers, community starting to splinter up. And, and you know, so we're going to look at a couple of those factors. But things. so, yeah, this is really the, the, the core of the issue here. So this is that chart that I was telling you about uh, and promising that I would address. So, you know, this is why, right? Up for all these years, the fees were under like sub one cent, you know, sub one cent or definitely under, you know, 10 cents, basically. Uh, and then... Uh, in 2017, 2018, this was the split here in August where Bitcoin Cash forked off because they could see these problems coming. And then there was a huge uh, fee issue on BTC where fees went up to about $50. But yeah, anyway, so the fees got up to uh, like uh, 56, you know, nearly dollars. And it was terrible, obviously, um, in that respect. Uh, and that was at the, that was what brought the previous bull run to a stop was that it was kicking off and everybody was excited and everything. And then as the fees got worse and worse, it stopped being used. And then that was part of the, the whole uh, crash. So that was the, the precedent that it couldn't sustain that, that growth despite the fees. And so now we've had this recent bull run and it, it's powered up uh, a ton. Um, but obviously with the dropping hash rate, like we were talking about before, uh, and already being at that limit uh, for, so, for so long, the fees have been going up and up and up. And now they're just going absolutely like to the moon here with uh, $64 type, um, type of fees. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, people stopped using it basically because at the time as all of that uh, kicked off, the fees got worse and worse and worse. And then the people who actually wanted to use crypto, 
they all moved off into other coins, right? They moved off into Ethereum. They moved off into Bitcoin Cash after it had forked off. They moved it into all the other different ones. So that relieved some of the transaction pressure on the network, which has then slowly been building up again this last uh, few years, where now it's just constantly at that pressure. And if, if the pressure increases, if there's a big surge in the price or people want to send it around more or anything, then all that does is the only release valve is just the fees, which just rock it up. And essentially there's no limit to that. So we're going to wait and see how how high the fees can get before Bitcoin you know, becomes totally unusable. At, at what point the average investors stop buying in, basically. It, it is literally just a bidding war between people. At some point, this turns into a panic to get out, right? It becomes a game of musical chairs. Who's the last one holding the the bitcoins as they become uh, worthless right if the price crashes yeah yeah exactly well that, <laughs> that's why i don't recommend it to the the listeners and that that's where you can imagine if you combined this with a surge in the bitcoin cash price which was then attracting more of the hash rate so instead of seeing the hash rate switch off with the miners in china if instead they would uh, you know swapping ships to bch then that could be a feedback loop that just drives BDC into irrelevance. So uh, we will see. But interestingly, it can't work the other way, right? Because Bitcoin Cash, well, firstly, they're already in the minority. So if it was going to happen, they would already be dead. But uh, they change their difficulty to adjust every block. So they only need to get to the next block and the next block and the next block and it stabilizes. But for Bitcoin Cash, it's two weeks of blocks. So if the you know if the timing is bad like we saw at the start of this one where it was the start of that two week cycle and their hash rate drops off then that two weeks suddenly becomes three weeks before they get another adjustment and if it went further down it would be four weeks and so it could drop faster as the runway sort of extended out in front of them basically we're at this yeah all time highs with uh, the fees and uh, yes yeah, so that's bad news for BTC basically so especially when you combine it with the price so uh it's kind of had this bit bubble but in the previous bubbles like this other one here or this one uh way back here uh you know there was just this huge euphoria as everybody was ah oh, the adoption was kicking off more and more people were getting involved there was more confidence in the community that it was going to be the global reserve currency and this is the future and more trade and merchants getting on board all kinds of stuff right but they're just this time around, there hasn't been that because like you're saying, nobody's actually using it. Everybody's just buying on PayPal or whatever and hoping for the number to go higher. So it, even though it wasn't initially a Ponzi scheme, it's then become a Ponzi scheme right in time for a lot of people who thought it was a Ponzi scheme to realize that it's, to think that it's not a Ponzi scheme <laughs> and they're all getting involved. And yeah, if the, if the price just crashes off, that could just be it. Kept ponzi Yeah unlucky you know get get bitcoined as uh, i saw somebody phrase you know maybe that's the way it will go right so uh you know this is just strikes me as very strange the previous bubbles it was straight up and then a big crash and then slowly you know returning to reality right but this time it's kind of been up and then down a bit and then up and then down and then up and then down and up it's not at all like the previous uh bubbles mm -hmm. so uh the fees obviously are now kicking in and so maybe that's why we've seen the, the price really starting to crash off and this is bad news for bitcoin as well on another front is because not only is their price crashing the rest of the crypto market goes down when bitcoin goes down but increasingly it doesn't or not as much so like we saw with dogecoin uh going through the roof recently and then obviously others ethereum bitcoin cash and so on and so forth uh bitcoin drops off and they just they only slide down a little bit and so yeah. there's there's increasingly going to be a divergence i think between the, the price of um you know bitcoin uh as the market leader and and the rest which are more being judged on their own individual merits as everybody starts to realize okay well bitcoin's not the bellwether that it used to be every time every time you throw up a new graph it takes me about 10 to 15 takes me a while to figure out exactly what i'm looking at yeah 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 so uh, this uh graph here maybe just for you give some explanation so orange is bitcoin uh so yeah, i it guess it's, it's percentages of, of market of the market yeah yeah basically relative which is why 
the blue one and the orange one meet together because one of them spiked obviously meant the other one had to dip. That's right, exactly. Because exactly. all the numbers have to add up to 100. Yeah, yeah. So you can see this chart there. It's also a version that is a stacked chart where it all adds up to 100. But I think it's sort of uh, clearer if you can see the, the spikes and troughs um, yeah. relative to each other, right? So yeah, Bitcoin was 90, 95%, and then it sort of slid down to close to 80%, but it was still, you know, the king. And then right at this last um, point here, flash point in the middle of 2017, which was at the time of that last fees rocketing up, right? So they're connected. Uh, uh, and that, that was when that happened. And now we're maybe starting to see that again with the fees rocketing up uh, and the dropping off of uh, B2C, which was this time it doesn't even have that kind of buffer to being 85%. This time it's only starting at 65%. And it's already lost a lot of ground. Uh, so, yeah, very, very bad news for uh, Bitcoin potentially. Um, you know, so, and today, today it was uh, sub 50%, uh, back to 49.7% uh, for the first time in uh, in quite a long time. So, well, I guess in two years. What, yeah. what does market capitalization even really mean if no one can spend it? I well, that's right. That's a good question. It is a little bit of a meaningless metric in that sense that, uh, it's, you know, like I can, people always criticize market cap like this and it's right where you can say, let's say I can make a, a coin. We're going to make a million of those coins and then I'm going to sell one to you for $1. You buy it from me for $1. Bam, we've got a cryptocurrency worth the million dollar uh, market cap, right? But there's... Oh, the, the market cap is just the price of each coin multiplied by how many yeah, coins by the supply. there exactly. are. So it's, it's literally that simple. So... Uh, in that sense, it's it's a pretty bit of a terrible metric, right? Because, like I said, it can be very easily manipulated, especially by currencies where one or a small amount of people own a lot of it, uh, as well. You know, but nobody really knows how to assess the value of a cryptocurrency because it's such a new thing. So, market cap has been it's just very easy a number to boil it down and it's also something you can do to every crypto but for instance the value of ethereum yeah. where they're doing smart contracts and this and that you know all this different stuff completely different uh to the value of um you know uh, bitcoin which was going to be the global currency and is now being digital gold and all these things are just changing and fluctuating so fast that nobody really knows so people like to look at the coin market cap because it's an easy ranking uh it's very easy to understand and follow i guess it's it's a useful it is at least useful metric it's at least a number you can yeah. look at so it gives some sort of a an idea but it's definitely not uh perfect but it's it's what we've got and i i definitely find this quite a undeniable uh trend anyway and i think we might be seeing yeah huge um huge issues here for bitcoin uh whether or not their community clues in so yeah, this is uh, the, uh, oh man, most problems with the slides, I should say block size limit. But uh, so I saw, I made the, when I was making these slides, I thought, okay, well, wh where do we trigger a big flash point within the BTC community? Because as fees go higher and higher and higher, surely somebody is trying to transact on the chain and they think what's going on here, right? And because Bitcoin Cash uh, and Bitcoin SV to a certain extent have already demonstrated that you can raise the block size and it doesn't cause a calamity instantly, which was this sort of narrative originally, but that's been proven false. Uh, are we going to see the people in the BTC community kind of start to say, look, this is ridiculous, $100 fees, you know, $150 fees. At what point do they start this kind of outcry? And so uh, this guy, Cobra, who is uh, big in the BTC community, he put up a poll and had... Uh, 18.6% of people said we should look at a block size limit by 2025. That's an eternity in crypto terms. Uh, but still, even with that longer time frame, still only 18% of people thought, yep, maybe the block size limit. 53% still no and 27% undecided. But Cobra, this has already happened. This happened in 2017. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, Bitcoin Cash uh, forked off. They raised the limit and... Well, now now it's doing its thing, right? It's still working and doing more transactions than BTC, but 
BDC, they they they're dug in, they're committed, you know. So, uh, but if if like the pain for those users uh, is obviously going to just keep escalating, right? And so, obviously, in my mind, it will be easier for those users to defect into Bitcoin Cash rather than try and wade through this still majority of people that are just dead set against it. No, we're never uh, raising the block size limit. Okay. Okay. Um, Cobra is a is Cobra well, a person? It's a Twitter, it's or a a Twitter account, but it's run by one of these guys who. I assume it's a guy, I guess I don't know, but I'm pretty, pretty sure it's a guy uh, who uh, I think owns the domain name Bitcoin.org, maybe. So has sort of for a long time okay, that you know, been in the community. I read, um, I read some news today that uh, our old pal Craig oh, yeah. Wright is suing Cobra <laughs> for having the white oh, paper no up. He'll sue anybody he, he can you know, shake a finger at, really. So good, good luck to him with that. But uh, that... I wonder if it's I wonder if it's possible for everyone to jump on a class action. I against guess that's him what somebody for did pretending to be. Yeah, I think somebody, somebody did sort of start counter suing him to do with the fact that he was like, yeah, wasting their time with these lawsuits that didn't have any backing or or yeah, it was something like that. Some claims that he'd made that I, I don't know. Well, I don't know what it was about, but basically, I think somebody was starting to play him at his own game. I mean, you know, obviously he loves lawsuits and the reason he loves lawsuits is because he was a law professor. So that's where he's comfortable. You know, that's his home ground. And it's, it's like, it's very like, Such it's very like nerd. Donald Trump as well, where it's just like, I'm just going to throw as much lawsuits at somebody and hope that I have enough money. So even they're all going to fail, like that will intimidate them or scare them off or something like that. But it just doesn't really work, right? <laughs> like, uh, if you don't have a point, if you don't have an argument with the court, the court ultimately their job is to get to the bottom of things. So they're not just going to look at it and be like, "Well, this is your tenth shitty lawsuit. It's still a shit lawsuit, though. So go away." <laughs> like, <laughs> they're not going to change their mind after the seventeenth failed attempt of like take down the Bitcoin white paper. All right, fine, Craig, you've beaten us down. Yes, yeah, you it's win. It's not going to happen. So he can just waste his own money. And unfortunately, the money of everybody he sues. Uh, but at some point, he's going to run out of money. So good luck to him with that um, strategy. Well, uh, he, he would, if he really was Satoshi, he'd be able to immediately right. prove it through. So I don't, I don't know how he's even given platform at this well, point. I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you're, the, you're the one who brought him up, bro. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, that's, I guess I am. That's the I problem, guess I right? It's something, once something's in the, in the conversation, it gets more in the conversation and just uh, circulates around, you know, it's uh, ultimately just want to let it fade out into irrelevance, Strikes right? But effect. yeah, uh, so I'm sure he'll still be in the conversation for a while. I'm sure he's still going to be making a lot of noise, but I mean, to me, he's pretty much irrelevant. So I don't really... Uh, bring him up on this podcast yeah he's a, he's a bit crazy so yeah oh, so sorry. like the question is how high can bdc fees go at what point uh do they uh you know to the, the community kick in as we saw 50 percent of people uh willing to vote on this twitter poll said not even by 2025 so i uh, got this tweet from this guy matt odell who i believe also some well i guess he's got 333 likes on his tweet so must have a few people following his Twitter as, as an example of somebody who was in this mindset. So he's, he says, if you are not ready for these high Bitcoin fees, do not panic. Fees should come down substantially in a few weeks after the next difficulty adjustment. That said, I expect fees to trend up in general. So after that adjustment, you really need to prepare for a higher fee future. So the conversation is not even around what do we do about fees or this is a big problem. In fact, it's just like, the users are to blame if the whole currency is broken. And then his reply is to himself is, sustained high fees are expected and necessary to prevent denial of service, spam, attacks that can threaten decentralization and therefore censorship resistance. Sustained high fees will secure the Bitcoin network long term. Fees are designed to pump forever. Embrace them. So this is just like how far out of touch with reality do you have to be that you know how you can have the world's most secure network that no one can afford to use great work so just immediately the thing that comes to my mind is that 
Um, he's saying spam spam attacks that threaten decentralization. I'm guessing what he means is sending through lots and lots of uh, tiny transactions in order to clock yeah. up the network. Yeah, that's that's the idea. But yeah. What I, all I can see is that that's a, almost a benefit to the currency because it provides miners with with this with a system to that's mine. That. So that's not even a that's not even yeah, an issue. That, well, that's the whole uh, difference in philosophy, right? Is that in Bitcoin Cash, a lot of small transactions. That's exactly what you want because that's what no other currency can do. That's how people can be playing blockchain dot poker and noise dot cash and sending each other one cent because no other payment system currency you know in the world supports that. Not online microtransactions. Even PayPal. Yeah, PayPal. It costs whatever minimum transaction of thirty cents and whatever. Right? It's not. It's not feasible. So. That was the one of the geniuses of, of Bitcoin that it made that feasible. And yeah, obviously, if you have a lot of transactions, well, that's not spam. That's literally just, I mean, it's not up to any individual to decide what is what is or is not a valid transaction, right? As long as it's valid according to the network rules. And if it pays the fee, which is less than one cent and is adding, you know, incrementally to the miner's income to secure the whole system, that's a valid transaction, right? But uh, this sort of, narrative i guess that some people have that uh, it's spam well they don't want to have any spam so it now costs uh, i guess it's now too expensive to spam the bitcoin network but it's going to be too expensive for anybody to actually use it <laughs> really so their own users Think, thinking yeah. again back to the white i need to have another look at the white paper now that i know a lot more about um yeah. what's going on but thinking back to it if um if the fees increase like this, like this yeah. guy's saying, then the number of transactions significantly decreases, yeah. which means that the number of miners, uh, nodes, the number of mine, mining yeah. computers there are will also significantly decrease, which means that the prospect of attack on the whole system is significantly increased. Uh, yes, yes and no. Like, you sort of got the right idea, but kind of the wrong specifics in the sense that uh, it's true that if the fees are very high, then there is still going to be a very high incentive for miners because there'll be so much, even if there's only, you know, a hundred transactions, if each of those ones is paying a thousand dollars, let's say for the sake of the I mean, that's a thousand, you know, a hundred thousand dollars in, in revenue for the miners. So there'll still be a lot of incentive for people to mine and there will still be a lot of people doing the mining. But on the other hand, uh, you've got that strong security in terms of the miners, but very low security in terms of everything else. Like you're saying, there, there won't be any users, right? So there, there will just be very few people. So if the government wants to regulate it or whatever, they're only fighting a tiny minority of the population rather than you know half the country is using crypto, then they're obviously yeah. going to be upset if the government tries to mess about with it. Uh, too much or you know you obviously you have less and less businesses that it's integrated with and less and less commerce less and less utility in general if you just have such high fees right yeah yeah definitely take another look at the uh the white paper though yeah i'll be interested to hear how you find it uh i was impressed that you even yeah. gave it a crack <laughs> the first time around but yeah now i mean one thing to look out for is in the uh, white paper you will notice though that when satoshi uh, writes about nodes that means mining nodes satoshi didn't really well until he gets down to simplified payment verification in uh, section 8 or, or whatever it is um, but there was no such thing as mining pools or non-mining nodes or whatever in satoshi's days of bitcoin because uh, the, the whole network was so uh, young at that point but satoshi did incidentally predict uh, mining pools and predicted a lot of stuff that ended up uh, coming true in the in the Bitcoin ecosystem. So definitely, <laughs> definitely knew what was up with that uh, revolutionary concept that uh, he invented. So. Yeah, what, what a, it's one of those ideas that you kind of think this is the kind of idea that someone would come up with if they had access to yeah. a time machine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it it it, it actually does. I mean, to be honest, it's been absolutely amazing. It sort of almost defies belief that this new idea was introduced and since since inception, it has essentially defeated every challenge to date. And the bigger it gets, actually, the stronger it is. So if it was going to fail, it would have failed early. Uh, 
but it's mm. it's survived everything and in fact it's thrived against every possible attack you know whether it was the economics failing or some part of the technology or a bug in the code or obviously we've seen attacks on the community in some sense of like censoring people and manipulating the discussion and whatever and whatever and it's just adapted and just morphed and changed around every single uh problem like it's it's actually unreal <laughs> you know we're all very lucky to be uh witnessing this this story live because you couldn't you couldn't write yeah. it in a reality is stranger than fiction really in that sense i i also wonder what this uh what this gentleman expects the 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 top level of of bitcoin fees to be i don't know he says it's going to pump if forever. Designed... <laughs> well that's what i mean if it pumps forever do you want to pay ten thousand dollars to make a transaction how's how's that even going to work how could it pump forever how is that <laughs> yeah i just your guess is as good as mine I, I i think the logic is something along the lines of because you've got to understand that it's all bound up in this we're all getting rich because the price is going up so if the price is going up forever we're all getting infinitely richer we can afford to pay infinitely more fees i suppose is sort of the I see. of course all that uh, you know ignores the reality that it has turned into a uh, a ponzi scheme for real it, it has actually turned into a bubble yeah. and that at some point it's going to pop all right so uh it's like an old it's the old boys club that that i was talking about finance in general yeah, being earlier right. you are now not allowed to join the club of yeah, Bitcoin. because if you don't if you don't have enough money for the fees today like if you don't have enough for 60 dollars of fees to make one transaction it's crazy because then it's 60 dollars to get and then 60 dollars mm -hmm. to send it so really you need $120 and that's just the entry fee. That's before even your amount of money. And nobody's going to send under $120 for $120. And nobody's probably even going to send $1,200 for $120. Uh, so yeah, it's just, yeah. it's just turned into uh, this kind of thing. And so, yeah, we've seen here now, of course, uh, the real, you know, problems begin even after all of that is that uh, you, we were talking earlier about the nodes and about, different uh, versions of the software well this guy luke jr who is one of the contributors to bitcoin core and in the past has been uh controversial uh for uh, you know changes he's wanted to make he has then begin begun trying to put in this thing taproot which is this update to bitcoin uh, core i haven't looked into all the details so i can't give you a huge uh, rundown of that but essentially it's an upgrade that they want to do to add some more sort of uh, Schnorr signatures, which are already in Bitcoin Cash, and also to put in more smart contracts, so to kind of make it a little bit more Ethereum-like in some sense. Um, but he he wants to put this in, but in, because not everybody was agreeing with it, instead he just made his own version and then he published it, sort of pretending that it was the official version. Uh, and now uh, people are getting, you know, pushing back. And what is this? Why? How did you just put this in? We didn't all agree to this. And uh, this was, of course, exactly what happened when BDC and BCH split was, you know, the people who were in control of the software repo, they started just putting in change. Everywhere. We don't agree with that. And then it just devolves into a huge uh, clusterfuck, basically, of everybody arguing over who or what was in control and who was allowed to do what. And then uh, eventually Bitcoin Cash, they just said, okay, we'll, we'll just do it our own way. And they just split off. Uh, but <laughs> it's now coming back to bite, you know, uh, yet again for BDC. And, and you can imagine this sort of piles on top of their other problems with the hash rate dropping, with the fees going through the roof. It, it's, just a, it's just a mess. Yeah, it's, that's, but yeah, that's something that's really struck me. Um, but since I guess maybe in, in the last even two or three weeks since I've started actually following the well at least the BCH community is it's just seems so friendly in comparison with the kind of um especially in comparison with like what I assumed the like toxic like it's like online 4chan yeah. club is what I imagined crypto to be like, but b all of the b all of the BCH people just seem so like ha happy and excited and friendly and, and keen and 
and yeah, it's just it's. I'm kind. Of, I'm I'm hesitant to call it a movement, it but it it's a yeah. nice. It's a nice, yeah. It's a nice kind of thing to feel like you're a part of. Yeah, yeah. It's a social. It's a social movement, you know. And it, it's in. It's both fortunate and unfortunate that it is tied into money, right? Because everybody who is in the Bitcoin Cash community, yeah. as the community grows and spreads, everybody in it gets richer, right? I mean, that's good because it actually provides more funding and resources to spread it further. So it is a self perpetuating uh, cycle like that. But then that does mean that obviously people on the outside are skeptical because there's a financial motive involved and so you kind of have to get them over that hurdle you know which which yeah. takes you know it's a perpetual challenge of crypto but obviously and then you hit the point where people only enter because they only care about the financial aspect right. of it yeah so uh, i think you know it's very important that it is uh yeah that we try and be as a, as a movement try and be friendly and welcoming and uh you know try and explain things at a deeper level that's a big motivation for me in this podcast as to you know to get cut away so much of that uh and and let people get to the real conversation the real world changing technology um and and ideas that are being uh, being brought up in cryptocurrency but obviously that's a bit of a perpetual battle which i've been fighting for you know eight or nine years at this point and so a lot of the community uh, more or less and and now you will be too, uh, you know, going forward. But slowly the word, slowly the word is getting out there, right? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm at the point where I'm trying to pay my friends back for things in in Bitcoin, even at a slight, even even though I want to hoard it all yeah. like a dragon. Um, I'm like, yeah, let me let me pay you back for for mm. for tennis with 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 some BCH. It's like, no, no, it's 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 mafia yeah. money. Like oh okay. okay. Yeah, well, you just gotta, you just gotta. I mean, they're just interested when they're interested. Like it's, it's funny because I had a friend that I, uh, I did that same thing. It was in about 2014 or something like that, um, and uh, it was my mate and I and this third friend. And so the two of us had uh, Bitcoin. This third friend, we said, oh yeah, just you know, he bought the beers, and we said, hey, look, we'll pay back in in Bitcoin. And there was sort of a bit of wrangling around, right? But he agreed to it uh and so we gave him time we gave him like 15 dollars or something like that and then about four or five years later he sent me a message he was like holy crap my bitcoin's worth like 500 dollars or something and he said yeah yeah you know you know pretty good uh beers like you know return on yeah. investment <laughs> right? pretty, yeah, uh, and he was like yeah yeah you know but the funny thing was after all that the only question he had was how do, how do i sell it and get dollars you know and it was like people just don't make that connection it's like even with the value has gone up this much and you're not thinking what's going on here why i don't know anything about this all i know is that it's gone up you know 10x or 20x or whatever whatever it was and and his he hadn't like people don't intuitively connect that actually that means that my dollars have got less valuable against this uh they think oh wow i can cash it out for more dollars right so yeah, I don't actually know. I haven't heard from him in a while, so I wonder what his thoughts are now. But as far as I know, he just went and sold it as quickly as possible, and then has forgotten about <laughs> cryptocurrency again. So well, now that five hundred bucks is probably yeah, thousands yeah. now. It's probably even more. If only he. If only I'd kept those beers as as bitcoins. Yeah, that's it. Should have. Uh, well, you know, people people learn one way or another, right? Sometimes it takes them uh, takes them a lot of. Uh, a lot of chances so yeah anyway basically uh there's obviously all this drama with uh you know bdc core but essentially they're just rehashing the problems of uh they already had in the initial fork they haven't solved anything and uh yeah good luck to them to that while they're um while they're sort of falling apart with the fees and all that so yeah this is now bch obviously on the up and up uh from 110 to 1 uh, or less bch to bdc now 60 to 55 in the last week so a pretty good spike here it hasn't turned into rolling momentum uh moving forward but we the, like i said the potential is there it sort of shows that if there was another spike you know that it only needs to double in the ratio a couple more times okay 60 to 30 30 to 15 if it gets that close i mean that's a huge increase from the bch price where it's at now 
then then people are really going. Is this happening? Like, at what point does the the does this trend uh, end? And uh, obviously, as the B two C community are falling apart uh, in their you know internally on several different fronts, defecting to BCH becomes increasingly uh, a good prospect for B two C holders. I feel a little bit bad because, I mean, again, I, I I'm I'm super new to this, but. Uh, and maybe this maybe this is bad this is a this is bad of me but every time i kind of think about btc is kind of having difficulty it like my heart smiles <laughs> a little bit mine too but <laughs> i have a little kind of evil grin like yes fight fight yeah. each other well that's right i mean the the chaos is our uh, is our game really i mean it's the most unfortunate part of it is that a lot of people are going to get caught in the crossfire and that People who did not mm. know, you know, so much about it, or who only sort of heard one side of the story, that they are going to invest probably more than they should, and when it's all going to blow up, they're going to be, you know, uh, like, and they're, they're going to be uh, sunk on all sides because if it blows up and their investment goes south, well, everybody that they told about crypto is going to say. Either if either if they were in crypto in another coin, they're going to say, "Yeah, look, we told you, mate." And then if they are not in crypto, they will say, "Yeah, I knew crypto was a scam. Told you." So they're going to get squeezed in the middle there. Um, but the best that can yeah. be done, I guess, is to is to sort of get the word out there and uh, hopefully, if yeah, if, if uh, you know, keep your own uh, social network uh, up to speed on on crypto as best as you're able. Obviously, everybody can make their own decisions. And do their own research and spend their own money on uh, whatever they want, but uh, who knows? B two C could go I, I, higher. I think it's part of the it's part of the duty of a friend to inform a friend about things that a friend needs to yeah, know. Yeah, so. yeah, definitely. But uh, yeah, you can just like my friend with the beers, right? I tried to explain to him, look, here's fifteen dollars of Bitcoin, and then I tried to explain to him, you might not want to sell you five hundred dollars of Bitcoin. But uh, sometimes people people are going to make their own uh, choices, so. He wanted a new PS4. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm sure he had a, a couple of good nights with the the money he made out of that uh, the yeah, fiat currency he got. So yeah, so this is my community comment of the week uh, as we're getting towards the end of the show uh, now. Uh, so this is somebody I was talking to asked to remain anonymous, but they said this is basically how the, the Bitcoin BTC house is gonna he's gonna know you know it's gonna go down in flames. They said, diehard useful idiots who think BTC is actually about freedom, they will be well and truly fucked. The insiders who know the scam, they will get out first. The investors who give zero fucks about BTC will get out. The businesses who depend on BTC being the king will be yelling at everybody to calm down as the house burns, etc. And that, to me, that, that was just the summary. Like, once one card in the house uh, at the bottom falls out, then the whole thing just rickety and... and and collapses and uh i think we're starting to see a little bit of that right now basically yeah it's i kind of my heart does go out to anyone who ends up in an unfortunate situation based on on this kind of whole thing because it is it is a it, it it will ruin some yeah. people. Yep. Yeah, you got to learn the hard way, unfortunately. Sometimes, I mean, in crypto, it's made a lot of people rich and, and ruined a lot of people, uh, you know, in different ways. Uh, for sure, I've been on, you know, I've been on the ups and the downs with crypto and uh, that's that's just how it is, how it is really. Uh, it's a traumatic process for humanity to slowly figure out this, colossal civilization level uh shift right and everybody's going to have their own um perspective and their own involvement in that right so yeah i think just the most important thing for the listeners is just try and get uh as educated as you can so yeah listen to this podcast but also just read up on other sources of information and mostly try and get hands-on experience try and actually just buy five dollars transfer it around, learn about wallets, understand how it all works. 
it will be well, well <laughs> worth your time uh, to do so. But that that is critical to uh, you know minimizing your chances of uh, of coming out on the wrong end of uh, of, of something that uh, you can't really ignore uh, either. So that's not really an option. So it's also something you can't personally control. Well, that's that's the thing. It's like you don't want to tie yourself to the to a yeah. boat that you don't have any control yeah. over. Yeah, I mean, obviously, people can spread out their you know investment in the crypto scene and buy different coins that they like, or or you that's know, true. and obviously only invest uh, you know small amounts that they're comfortable losing, and and that you know if if that coin doesn't really pan out or or whatever but yeah the main thing is to is to is to just learn learn by experience and just make the cost of that learning very very small uh, until you know what you're doing so yeah finally we just have uh, a bit of a meme of the week this one's a, a quality joke here with this uh, website hippie.tv so they posted we accept crypto payments including doge we accept usdc xlm ltc knc doge bat ethereum btc and zcash and this one guy paolo agazone on uh, twitter responded seriously you support all those useless crap and no bitcoin cash clowns and so what did they do they started accepting bitcoin cash and they put his tweet on a shirt <laughs> which they're now selling oh, for bitcoin cash absolutely so, uh, that, that made me laugh that was pretty uh, quality banter from hippie.tv um <laughs> that's, that's that's good i like that. that's classic <laughs> uh i don't know that i would want to buy that shirt but it's pretty funny that they did it even if it was uh just for the lols right so that's pretty much uh getting towards the end of the show so i've tried to add this segment as well a message to the community where i have a guest you know they can uh feedback something to the to the bitcoin cash community so that we can you know have a bit more uh dialogue and obviously everyone hears enough about what i think so yeah do you have uh, anything you'd, you'd like to sort of spread uh in the zeitgeist of uh how bitcoin cash can oh, improve or I w no i think my um i think i've i've said i've done this throughout yeah. the episode to be honest uh, my general my general message to the community would be as a severe newcomer, like super new, um, just, just thanks. I've not come across anyone who's been, who's like taken the piss for me not knowing what I'm talking about. People are helpful and informative and kind and just, yeah, thank, thank you. All of you, all of you. Thank you. Um, and keep, keep it up because um yeah if if there's anyone else like me who's brand new to this whole thing you're going to make them stick around by being the way you currently are yeah that's my message to no, the community that's, great. that's a great one. it's very uh very positive i'm very glad to hear it and then obviously that uh, that's where i've talked about on some of the other podcasts and so on that uh really the value of a coin is the value of its community right uh is that in the long run the whole point of a cryptocurrency is just facilitates a trade with other people. So you need other people for it to work. Uh, and that ultimately that's a, the hardest thing to create is not even the mine, you know, the mining network or the software or whatever. It's building a, a community of people that, that are, you know, cause it's all voluntary. It's not, not like a government currency where you can force people to use it, you know, with a gun and say, pay your taxes or else. Um, in crypto somebody has to use it because they want to and so uh, it's important that a uh, community is, is welcoming and accepting and makes people want to be want to be a part of that uh so it is a different yeah global community it should be as inclusive and, and friendly as possible and yeah i think uh, we've been doing a good job of that and, and yeah hopefully that will carry on luckily it is self-perpetuating you know people who are introduced uh, in a friendly way are then more likely to to spread that to new users so yeah that's really the end of the show thank you to all the uh donators on the previous episodes slides and resources at uh, bitcoincashpodcast.com as per usual the audio feed and everything is available apple Podcasts, google Podcasts, spotify and stitcher um 
yeah, this episode we tried streaming live, but it overloaded my <laughs> bandwidth. So uh, anyway, hopefully I'll I'll chop up the audio a little bit and uh, uh, you know get it get it out there on demand afterwards. Um, thank you to everybody. And uh, Luke, do you have any shout outs for the show? Do you have you know any social media you want to plug or anything? I'm just gonna. I'm just going to really quickly donate to the podcast. I can do <laughs> yeah, that now. Well, there you go. It's really that uh, that simple and easy. You know, it's pretty uh, pretty amazing. But yeah, I, I have no idea who all my donators are, but I appreciate them a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, it really, I don't know. I don't really have. I don't really go for that kind of self promotion yeah. social media type thing. I'm just. No, I'm just here that, for the well, banner. That's, that's really good. I've been glad to have you, and I'm sure be uh, back for another episode uh, at some point yeah thanks it's thanks always, for having me always a pleasure mate so yeah uh thank you to the listeners and until next time he pulled out his laptop and bring up the site looked at me and said this will change your whole life then he started explaining the basics to me the miners make money by taking the fee every time a transaction is made incomplete and they work every minute and day of the week a guy named satoshi created this all he's the mastermind of it the brain in the ball there's a lot more to say but before i begin just tell me right now if you're out or you're in